the Holocaust is not only a German story, although it is a story about Germans. The Holocaust is a human story. It is our story. More than history, the Holocaust is a modern story of the possibilities within each of us. We are all the descendants of the Holocaust. We are the descendants of the victims and of the perpetrators, of those who stood by and of those who stood up, of those who were uninvolved and of those who were unaware. No matter who our individual ancestors were, we all have a place in this story. Through the telling of this story, our ancestors teach us to gather each precious remnant of our broken world and piece them back together. They teach us to create a new vessel that will hold us all in our love and our pain. In recollecting the Holocaust, we draw each other into this vessel. Together we discover glimmers of holiness in the holes and cracks for it is through these jagged windows that we see the paths to building a better tomorrow. As we recall the Holocaust, we resolve to follow the strength and courage of those who stood fast for righteousness. Even when enveloped by evil, we will hold on to our faith in humanity. Please read with me. We will emerge strengthened in our resolve to work for a better future. These paired candlesticks for the light that shines are a symbol of Jewish holy days and a beacon to guide us through the darkness. The mismatched candlesticks on which they rest remind us that even when we do not have all that we need, we can be alive in the darkness. We take inspiration from those who found the strength to be that light, from those who found the strength to stand when standing seemed impossible. We light these candles for the light that shines in the hearts of all who fight against evil. Please read with me. A single candle can both defy and define the darkness. Take a moment for a silent prayer or meditation. The story of genocide does not start with murder, but with people. Each is an individual with a story, a life that began before the darkness fell. We are all of these people, the victims and the perpetrators, the bystanders and the rescuers. No matter who our ancestors were, we step into these stories as if they were our own. In the voice of the Jews, we remember. Not so long ago, many of us lived in the lands of Europe and North Africa. We lived together, side by side, with Christians, Muslims, and others, as neighbors and as friends. We were Jews of many different sorts. We were religious and secular. We lived in cities and in small towns. We lived in many countries across the world. We spoke many different languages. We were doctors and dressmakers, printers and poets, scientists and shopkeepers, weavers and welders. We were a warm family whose life followed a quiet, carefree routine. Our roots reached back generation upon generation, living there amidst friends, neighbors, and acquaintances. With this loving background, the years flowed peacefully. Miriam Yakov, Holocaust survivor, Poland. In the voice of the bystanders, we acknowledge an ancient hatred undisguised was emerging from the shadows. While Jews faced violence and discrimination in many places, we held to our belief that it was not the case in our homes or among our neighbors. We believed we had grown beyond such ignorance. 
we did not recognize the approaching danger. The path to genocide is neither swift nor straight. The path to genocide is a slow burning fuse of degrading language and discriminatory policy. When we ignore the slowly rising shadows of hatred, those shadows engulf us. Victim or perpetrator, bystander or rescuer, we are all born with a desire to love, not a desire to hate. Without a watchful eye, we can get sifted in the service of ancient prejudices. In the voice of the Jews, we remember. Hatred spread across Germany like poison in water. The Germans afflicted us with cruel laws and humiliations. They did not care who we were or what we did. They did not care whether we were religious or secular, from the city or from the country, civilian or soldier, only that we were Jews. Every day they keep issuing new laws against Jews. Today, for example, they took all our appliances away from us. The sewing machine, the radio, the telephone, the vacuum cleaner, the electric fryer, my camera, and my bicycle. Augie said we should be happy. They're taking things and not people. Eva Heyman, Holocaust victim, Romania. Many of us fled. Many more tried to flee, but found there was no place to go. Some who thought we had found safe haven were sent back into danger. Trouble does not begin with fanfare, but as storm clouds building in the distance. We are very lucky tonight to be led by not only a wonderful Holocaust educator, but a storyteller as well. As part of this program, Violet will be sharing with us the story of Gerda Nicholas, told in sections throughout this evening. In the voice of the Jew, oh, sorry. I am Gerda Bickles. I was born May 14th in Breslau, Germany, 1931, just as Hitler was coming into power. The fact that Hitler had just come into power colored my entire life from there. My mother, Bronia was a Polish citizen. My father, Victor, who was also Polish, did not have that luxury. He had come into Germany looking for a way to better himself financially and lost his citizenship and so thus was considered a non-person. He used my mother's citizenship in Germany to help get jobs, to try to make a life for us. But that soon uh, became something that was not doable. When I was born, I was named Gerda. And Gerda was a very popular German girl's name that year. We spoke German. We ate German. We mingled with our German neighbors went to school with the Germans. I always thought I was German. I was born there. But slowly and harshly, we were made to know that we were nothing but Jews. And when that word was used, it was not used simply as our faith. It was to consider us a low, low person and not worthy of anything. My childhood was shattered by being told that I was less than nothing. In the voice of the Jews, we remember. The Germans crowded us into small ghettos, cut off from the outside world. There was never enough food. Death was a daily visitor. In these overcrowded ghettos, we lamented. I feel as if I am in a box. There is no air to breathe. 
Wherever you go, you encounter a gate that hems you in. I feel as if I have been robbed. My freedom is being robbed from me, my home and the familiar streets I love so much. I have been cut off from all that is dear and precious to me. Yitzchak Rudashevsky, Holocaust victim, Lithuania. Hate is unashamed. It presents itself in flowery words and broad smiles. It cloaks itself in flags and sings of better days gone by. While it distracts our attention with petty squabbles, it poison, its poison seeps the vigor of society. In the voice of the bystander, we acknowledge. When our neighbors began to disappear from our communities, it was not done in the dark. We knew that terrible things were happening to them. Most of us chose silence to look away and to ignore the hate. We waited. We waited to see when the cruelty would end. We waited for the hate to pass. We waited too long. We cannot wait, hoping hate will just go away. When hate is ignored, it makes itself comfortable. Then it grows. In the voice of the Jews, we remember. Holding on to the hope that we might one day be reunited, we sent our children into hiding. A few were sent to safety beyond the borders. Others found hiding places with friends, neighbors, and strangers. As mommy and Ami waved to me, I chose to hide my tears and I smiled. I wanted to give them strength. Ruth Westheimer, Holocaust survivor, Germany. We, the descendants of both bystanders and victims, remember how families separated in hope of survival. We weep for them. Where did they find such hope? Please read with me. Hope and, and faith, faith may seem great comfort, comfort, but they, they are still girders that give us, us the strength to stand. Please find a piece of paper, just any scrap will do. Get a pencil or a pen and write on that paper a hope that you have for your future, for your children's future, for your grandchildren's future, for your community's future. A personal hope. These notes represent our hopes for ourselves and our children. They represent our faith in the future. Let these hopes be a sweetness that lies beneath the bitterness. As we all did in a time of trouble, we now conceal our hope in a secret place to keep it safe. May we find it again at the end of our journey. Words fail as we come to the darkest times. In the voices of all the casualties of hate, we remember. A mixed multitude were caught in the night. Many of us died at the Nazis' hands. A special viciousness was aimed at the Jews and the Romani two cultures that the Germans were determined to eradicate. In the voice of the Jews, we remember. The Germans murdered us in staggering numbers. In many places, bystanders became willing participants in the violence. We were murdered without mercy. Mothers and fathers, children and grandparents, we were murdered simply for being Jews. In the voice of the Romani, we remember. For generations, we Romani have wandered free throughout Europe, yet distrusted and shunned. 
Strong families helped us endure, clinging to ourselves until the terror of the devourer. The Germans murdered us alongside the Jews, simply for being who we were. Mass graves filled the forests of Europe. In the voice of both the Jews and Romani, we remember. The Germans tore us from our homes, forcing us into slave labor camps and into death chambers. Those who could not work were murdered. Those who could work were kept as slaves until they too succumbed to starvation and illness. In our blind ignorance, we thought that deportation was a better solution. Fools that we were. We thought that the ghetto was the ultimate in abysmal blackness. We did not know that from here on, we would be severed and cut off from everything that was familiar and dear to us. We did not know that from that train ride on, we would be robbed of our whole world. Sarah Selber, Holocaust survivor, Poland. There is a sacredness in tears. They are not the mark of weakness, but of power. They are the messengers of overwhelming grief and of unspeakable love. In the Germans' mission to obliterate civilizations, they wiped whole communities from the face of the earth. The sudden silence, the emptiness, it took our breath away. We, the descendants of their remnant, grieve as we remember the many vibrant Jewish and Romani communities that were destroyed. This is a yard site can candle. It's lit once a year on the anniversary of the death of a loved one. The one I light tonight is for Gershon Adsitz, a 21-year-old Polish student who was murdered in the Holocaust. Let these lights shine as a symbol of life and love remembered. May they illuminate our memory and guide our future. Take a moment for a silent prayer or a meditation. We pause in terror before the human deed. The cloud of annihilation, the concentration of death, the cruelly casual way of each to each. But in the stillness of this hour, we find our way from darkness to light. How do we stay hopeful when people are capable of such great evil? Some recognize the evil for what it was. A few were willing to risk their lives to help. They hid friends, neighbors, and strangers from those eyes bent on harm. In almost every survivor's story, there is a story of someone who helped. These people are our ancestors too. In the voice of the rescuer, we know. We lived in every country in Europe. We came from every walk of life. Some of us saved hundreds. Some of us saved one. We did all we could to save as many as we could regretting only that we could not do more. Sister Gertruda Marchinet ran an orphanage and a home for girls suffering from tuberculosis in Poland. Exploiting the German fear of contagious diseases, she used the home as a cover to hide Jewish children. Once when Nazis came to search the home, she hid a little boy, Dan Landsberg, underneath her hammock. Standing motionless until the Nazis left, the nun said, once a child has come to me, their fate will be my fate too. In some places, whole communities stood together to protect Jews. 
for the mostly Muslim population of Albania, helping Jews was a matter of national honor. When the Germans invaded Albania, Nuro Paja, a teacher and religious Muslim, hid four Jewish families in underground bunkers in his house. Now we are one family, he told them. My sons and I will defend you against peril at the cost of our lives. Nuro Paja, Holocaust survivor, rescuer, Albania. In 1938, my father obtained a visitor's visa so that he was able to leave Germany and go to the United States. He and a friend posed as businessmen who were interested in being a part of the World's Fair, which would be in New York City the following summer. The consulate, the American consulate, who gave him the visa, offered to give one to our mother also, but my father and mother suspected their motives. They were afraid and turned him down. My father promised, he said, I will go and I'll find a job and I will send for you because he was going to get his visa extended maybe 30 days more and that would give him time. We didn't know that it would be eight years before we'd ever see him again. My mother and I were on our own. We were forced to take care of ourselves. My mother was a very resourceful woman and she knew that she had to do her best for her only child. And we had no one to depend on. There was no high placed friends. There was nothing that we could do to ask for help. So my mother took what money we had and she paid a guide to get us over the border into France. We couldn't take anything except what we could hold in our hands and then not very much because we, we didn't need to look like we were moving house and home. We had to be just walking. Once we made it into France, we made it to Lyon. It was a smaller town. We thought we could hide best there. Now I'm an 11 year old girl. I'm just thinking day to day. My mother had to think for both of us. And in her mind, how can I care for this child? How can I feed this child? In France at this time, the Vichy government had a program for Jews, French Jews. You could go to an office and they would give you uh, little coupons where you could take it to the market and get something. So my mother would risk going to number 12, Rue St. Catherine, to go up the stairs into the office, sign the papers, and get her vouchers, her coupons. I remember this day. I remember this day because it was cold and we were afraid. Now fear was our constant companion, but today there was something about it. The Nazis had been pulling people from their homes. They would grab you on the street. And I was so afraid that they were going to take my mother. And then what would I do? I took her hand as tight as I could hold it so she couldn't pull away. And we walked down the street together. We went into the number 12 Rue St. Catherine and went up the stairs. On the landing, there was a woman washing the floor or the handrails or something. She was cleaning it. And as we came up toward her, she looked at my mother. My mother looked at her. She did this. Without a question, without a second thought, my mother dragged me down the stairs, out the door. We went back to our little rat-infested apartment and we hid. 
It wasn't until later that evening that we discovered that the Gestapo had done a raid at number 12 that day, that 90 Jews had been arrested, 84 of which had been deported. The raid was directed by Klaus Barbie. He was the Gestapo head in Lyon. We didn't know that at the time. We didn't care. We were hiding. We were afraid. We didn't know who that woman was. We only knew that she had saved our life that day by putting her life in danger. If they had seen her, if she had been caught, she would have died as surely as the Jews grabbed on the street. We, the descendants of both bystanders and rescuers, honor the helpers so that we may gain wisdom from them. We must always strive for the courage to help those in need. Please place your hand on your heart and listen to these words. We reach for each other in fellowship and peace, pulling each other to safety. Each person's decision to help was difficult. The risks were many. Would we have made such a decision? We cannot know. We cannot judge. In gratitude and hope, we honor the helpers. We draw inspiration from them, and we vow never to be indifferent to the plight of others. Please read with me. Strength comes to those who pursue justice. An army arrayed to eliminate the future and memory of an entire culture could not destroy it. Faith in God, faith in the future, and faith in each other lit a candle of love. Our bodies failed, but our humanity stayed strong. In the voice of the Jews, we remember. Despite our enemy's eagerness to strip us of our Judaism and of our humanity, we continue to educate our children, to celebrate our holidays, to love and help each other. Although prayer was forbidden, we prayed in secret communities and within the secret places in our hearts. Our faith was the one thing they could not take from us. Rivka Wagner, Holocaust survivor, Poland. Hidden between the bunks, we whispered the familiar words of the Sabbath prayers and found tranquility. I discovered for the first time in my life the real power and value of prayer and faith in God. I could feel my words shattering the iron gates and the high-powered fences, going past the hundreds of guards, dugouts, and watchtowers, out into the open, reaching towards heaven. Here, I knew, was a way of escape, a source of strength, and a means of survival of which no power on earth could deprive me. Simka Unsdorfer, Holocaust survivor, Czechoslovakia. In the ghetto, a young boy defied the bitterness. From tomorrow on, I will be sad. From tomorrow on. Today, I will be happy. What's the use of sadness? Tell me that, because the evil winds begin to blow. Why should I grieve for tomorrow, today? No, today I will be glad. And every day, no matter how bitter it be, I will say, from tomorrow I shall be sad. Not today. Not today. A child in the ghetto. Liberation did come. As the armies of the world moved toward vanquishing evil, they discovered a hell that left them stunned. In the voice of the Jews, we remember. As we emerged from that hell, we asked, how do we move forward when we have lost so much? We walk with a hole in our hearts and wait in our footsteps, but we walk forward. We are reduced 
but we refuse to remain broken. While the world counted their dead, we counted our living. Those who lived gave us the strength to love again. We did not know what would come next. We only knew we could not go back to the life we once lived. I was one of several children that was smuggled into Switzerland. The person who arranged this told me, you have an obligation to survive. You must live. My mother stayed behind in France with the partisans. And although I was safe and they did feed me and make sure I had clothes. I was alone. I knew no one. And I was a child. I reconnected with my mother finally after a year. The Red Cross came and told me that I was to go to the border station and she would be there and she was. It was the most wonderful thing. You see, I wasn't a hidden child, I was a hiding child. So I was able to come out of hiding and show joy and happiness out loud in front of everybody. It was an amazing thing. In 1946, we reconnected with my father and he finally got us passage to America. Coming to New York was that was unreal, but it was also extremely frightening. I had to learn another language all over again. I went to school, but it was very, very difficult. We were not rich, yet we didn't suffer as we had back in France and Germany. But this fairy tale did not have a happy ending for my parents' marriage. They fought terribly and they ended up divorcing. I stayed with my mother and I was determined to do as I had been instructed, to live. So I studied hard. I got my MA and my master's degree in social work. And I worked at that job for many years. I married a wonderful Jewish man who was also a survivor. So he understood when I talked about them or I didn't talk about them. I worked hard. He worked hard. We had two wonderful children who I made sure had a good and a safe childhood and they gave us four wonderful grandchildren three boys and a girl and my delight is in those children and i would think i am grateful to the woman on the stair who told us without a word to go because of her i have my grandchildren In the voice of the bystanders, we acknowledge. As we watched our neighbors struggle to regain their footing, we found our own footing not quite so steady. For we remembered what we had been taught. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Matthew 25, 40. And we wished we had done more we know that we must reach out to all souls in need. Please read with me. Only by loving our neighbors with all our hearts can we heal the terrible hurt that has been done to the world. There is a light in this world, a healing spirit more powerful than any darkness we may encounter. Let us strive to be that light in the world. As it is written, 
love the whole world as a mother loves her only child. Lift your hands and open them, palms up. We take their sorrow into our hands to cleanse, to heal, to protect. We reveal our palms to express our hope, for hands are an extension of the heart. Read with me, please. The words, words are, are not enough. enough. It, it takes our hands to build. Our hope for the future is tempered by our tears for the lost. They left no footprints, no fingerprints. All we have is memory. In this moment, we acknowledge that they lived. Read with me, please. As, as long, long as, as we, we remember, remember them, them they, they are with, with us. The survivors entreat us. I ask you not to forget the dead. I ask you to build a memorial in our names, a monument reaching up to the heavens that the entire world might see. Not a monument of marble or stone, but one of good deeds. I believe with full and perfect faith that only such a monument can promise a better future. Only thus can we be sure that the evil that overturned the world and turned our lives into hell will never return. Donya Rosen, Holocaust survivor, Ukraine. Let us remember them as they lived. As we contemplate their pictures, we mourn the stories cut short, the hopes and dreams lost. We speak their names so they will not be forgotten. Some people in these photographs are not labeled with names, reminding us that although some stories are lost, we still acknowledge the people who lived them. For these, we simply say unknown. Let these few represent for us the many. These are pictures of people who were murdered in the Holocaust. Please read their names with us. Gisi Fleischmann. Rudy Sunlog. Unknown. Zipporah Picker. Schrega Picker. Emma Lewenberger. The Hilmitzberg. Unknown. Isabel Martin. Zoli Martin. If you know of someone who was murdered in the Holocaust or another genocide or hate crime, bring their, their name to mind now. Put it in the chat if you wish to share it with us. Let us pause for a moment of silent reflection on these that have been lost. We remember not only the uncountable Jewish and Romani dead, but also the many who were murdered alongside them. Gay people, people with disabilities, and the voices of resistance, all murdered in the great silencing of diversity, speech, and opposition. They are gone. They cannot tell their stories any longer, but we can. We can hold open the window, this fragile window. We can give their stories wings. Let us give their stories a voice so they can fly into others' ears, into others' hearts. Please read with me. Only, Only we, we can tell, tell their stories now. Only we. Please take a moment for silent prayer and meditation. In the aftermath of this horror, we awaken to a world where human beings have done unfathomable evil to each other. What do we do now? We weep and ask, 
How do we mourn so many lost, so many stories cut off before their turn? We recall each story, each name, each life. We remember how they were caught up one by one in the web of hate. We remember their strength, how they held on to love and life and hope, even in the harshest times. Their stories teach us that the thread of life is strong. As survivors say, grandchildren are the best revenge. Overwhelmed by the enormity of the story, we whisper, I do not want to hear any more. We draw inward to comfort one another, and yet we know ignoring evil only allows it to grow. Despite our unease, we choose not to be blind. We choose awareness because we recognize that evil does not need our help, just our indifference. Hans Lohenbach, Holocaust refugee, Germany to America. We cry out in anger. How could this happen? Where was the world? We remember not only the evil of those bent on harm, but also the goodness of those few determined to help. We resolve to turn our anger into passionate drive to make the world a better place for everyone. Awakened, we inquire, how does such hatred grow? How can we stop it? Hatred grows when we ignore it, when we allow hateful behavior to go unchallenged. We will not let evil hide in the shadows. We resolve to shine a spotlight on hate and make it clear that such behavior is not acceptable. We will be vocal torchbearers of love. Learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow, the important thing is not to stop questioning. Albert Einstein, Holocaust refugee, Germany to America. My husband, Norbert, is a scientist. And a few years before his retirement was offered a position in Paris, France. He knew my past. He wanted to know if I was prepared to go back. He was my safe place to fall. I trusted him. So I said, yes, let's go. We lived in Paris and I walked, I walked to areas that I had been to before, but this time I could go in the restaurants. This time I could buy whatever little thing I wanted to buy. I did not have to be afraid. I made friends. I learned a little French. I went with a friend of mine one evening to hear a, um, a lecture and a book, do a book signing from a lady named Germaine Ribier. She had been with the resistance. And because my mother had stayed with the resistance in France, I was very interested. I went up afterwards, spoke to her a little bit, had her sign my book, and she was encouraging. You see, I was thinking, I need to tell my story, if not to the world, but to my children and my grandchildren. So I felt encouraged. A few years later, in 1999, my husband was having breakfast reading his newspaper and he always loved to read the little uh, provincial papers there in France. And I heard him call my name and the way he said it made me on alert as it were. He read to me an obituary. It was for the woman, Germaine Ribier. And as it told about her life, it told about the time, <laughs> the time she dressed as a cleaning woman to alert the Jews at number 12, St. Catherine. I had seen her. I knew who my angel was. 
my first thought was that my mother did not get to live to know she had died four years earlier. But I knew. And it was a small consolation that I'd gotten to meet her and that I had her signature in my book. The angel of number 12, St. Catherine. The woman who had saved our lives saved my children's lives and my grandchildren's lives. She is listed at Yad Vashem as one of the righteous among the nation. She is on the wall of the righteous in Paris. She is listed at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Her people of France remember her. But I remember her, and my children will remember her. And now, after tonight, you will remember her. Our rescuer, our angel. Please join with me in this responsive reading an affirmation for the future. I pray for courage and for strength when I remember the evils in the past, the innocent people tortured and murdered. I am almost afraid to make myself remember, but I am even more afraid to forget. Please read with me. I ask for wisdom that I might mourn and not be consumed by hatred, that I might remember and yet not lose hope. I must face evil, and so doing reaffirm my faith in future good. I cannot erase yesterday's pains, but I can vow that they will not have suffered in vain. And so I pray, for, for those, those who were given death, I choose life, for me and for generations yet to come. For those who found courage to stand against evil, often at the cost of their own lives, I vow to carry on their struggle. I must teach myself and others to learn from hatred that people must love, to learn from evil, to live with good. We have many lessons to learn from the Holocaust. We have lessons to learn from the victims, from the bystanders, from the rescuers, and even from the perpetrators. In the voice of the children of the perpetrators, we recognize. Nothing we can do can atone for what our parents did. We cannot change this past. It haunts us and stains our lives, nor can we forget it. We did, do not celebrate our parents' deeds. We pour over the broken shards of a world they shattered. We hold that legacy as a beacon, a lighthouse, to warn of the perils of unchecked xenophobia and prejudice. For tragically, pieces of this story have been repeated all too often. Despite our earnest effort, there is still evil in the world. People are still persecuted for who they are. Anger and hatred, nurtured by prejudice, continue to take root in our communities. We, the descendants of the Holocaust, proclaim, there, there is, is still hope. hope. We each can, can make, make a difference. difference. Please find that paper on which you wrote your hope. Bring it back out. Read it to yourself. These notes represented our hopes for ourselves and our children. When we stand with hope, we brace ourselves with determination. Hope is not enough. We will turn that hope into a leap of action we will connect our hopes in the darkness to our action in the light. Now on the back of this paper, 
please write one positive step that you can take to make that hope that you had written a reality. We hope for peace and justice in our world. In this hope, we remember that peace and justice are not gifts from God. They are our gifts to each other. Ellie Wiesel, Holocaust survivor, Hungary. Across this world, we are many different people. We speak many different languages. Peace is a gift we can give in every language. Please read with me. Our differences disappear the moment we come to realize that all hearts are one. Through the broken windows of our history, we have seen bits of ourselves in all of these stories, in the victims and in the bystanders, in the perpetrators and in the rescuers. As we recall the Holocaust, we resolve to follow the strength and courage of those who stood fast for righteousness. We resolve to learn the lessons of the Holocaust so that no people shall ever suffer such a fate again. We say, never again. Join us in this responsive reading. Never again shall we ignore the gathering shadows of hate. Never, never again. again. Never again shall we stay silent at the preaching of malice. Never again. Never again shall we excuse those who hate. Never again. As long as poverty, injustice, and gross inequality persist in our world, none of us can truly rest. Never again shall we stand and watch while people are mistreated. Never again. Never again shall we allow groups of people to be separated and made unequal. Never again. Never again shall we watch a community plant the seeds of hate and do nothing. Never again. If your eyes be turned towards justice, choose for your neighbor that which you choose for yourself. Never again shall we think we are helpless to stop the coming of evil. Never again. Never again shall we forget our own strength. Never again. Never again shall we allow hatred to go unanswered. Never again. I raise up my voice, not so I can shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. Let us raise our voices for those who cannot. As it is written, justice, justice you shall pursue. Deuteronomy 16, 18. Never again will we turn our faces from the cry of for help. The need is here. The need is now. Justice, justice, we shall pursue. A day will come. A day will come when the softest sounds will be enough. When one lingering note, a delicate dance between two hands, a leaf spinning in the breeze, when one ringing bell when one whispered poem will be enough to awaken each person from that which is concealed, to bless this holy human with wisdom that bursts from the sacred well of justice, from the sweet, hearty, bubbling subterranean spring that nourishes the tree of life. Thank you for joining us this evening. All right, thank you everyone so much for attending this evening and a special thank you to Violet and Deborah and everyone at Teach the Show Foundation for coming here and taking the time out of your schedule to 
bring this wonderful and very important program to the library. So we appreciate you all so much. Um, and thank you again, everyone, for taking the time out of your evening to attend. And